In this strange time when so many of us are shut up in our homes, suppose you had the opportunity to ask somebody questions who knew exactly what was happening outside. Suppose he was an MD who understood the coronavirus in detail and that he held a doctorate in economics that enabled him to understand the economic implications of the virus. That describes my own position right now. I'm about to speak with Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, professor of medicine and my friend right here at Stanford. Jay, thanks for making the time to join us. My pleasure, Peter. This is a special Plague Time edition of Uncommon Knowledge with Peter Robinson. I'm Peter Robinson. Jay's in his office because he's considered an essential worker. I'm at home because whatever else I am, I'm not essential. And so we're recording this thing online. Jay, here's the first question. How bad is it? You published a piece in the Wall Street Journal this past Tuesday, March 24th. We're recording this on Friday. Quote, if it's true that the coronavirus would kill millions without shelter in place orders and quarantines, then the extraordinary measures are surely justified. But there's little evidence to confirm that premise. Explain that. Yeah, so I think uh, the, the key thing to, to, to know about the virus and how much we know about it is, is that uh, we actually don't know how many people have been infected. It's a very strange thing to say, given how much data is floating around. But it's re- it, and, and it sounds like it's a remarkable thing, but it's actually just a, a plain scientific fact. And that has to do with the fact that the testing for the virus has focused on people who actively have the virus. The, 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 the tests have been used everywhere. That's what it does. It, it looks and sees if the RNA for the virus is in you. And if, if it's in you, then it's positive. If it's not in you, it's negative, and then uh, that, that's, that's that, right? But this is not like uh, HIV, where if you get the virus, you have it for life. If you, most people, there's a range of presentations. You, you get the virus, you get some symptoms, and then you're better, and the virus is gone. And the test would be negative for someone like that. But there's increasing evidence that someone like that is, would probably be immune to being reinfected. So... Um, so we, when we talk about the, not the fatality rate, what is it called? The rate of lethality? Yeah, that's a ratio. It's a mathematical ratio in which the numerator is very sadly the number of people who die. Right. And the denominator is those who have been tested, right? That, so that's the measured case fatality rate. All right. The measured, measured case, fatality case fatality rate. rate. And, the, and the problem is that denominator does not count the people who got infected and were recovered. All right. Two quotations, Jay. Here's Dr. Anthony Fauci. We all know he's as famous as the president right now. He's the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And here he is in early March, just a couple of weeks ago. Quote, the flu has a mortality rate of 0.1%, one-tenth of 1%. This, meaning the coronavirus, has a mortality rate of 10 times that, close quote. Here's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya in his piece in the Wall Street Journal. Again, this is March 24th, just a couple of days ago. Quote, and you're talking about uh, when you think the first, the virus was first seeded in this country. Quote, an epidemic seed on January 1st implies that by March 9th, about 6 million people in the U.S. would have been infected. As of March 23rd, that Monday of this week, there were 499 COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. That's a mortality rate of 0.01%. In other words, a whole order of magnitude less than Dr. Fauci claimed just a couple of weeks earlier. I I think the thing is, nobody knows the number. The numbers we've seen are consistent with a very, very wide range from from an epidemic that will kill two to four million people on one end and an epidemic that will kill 50 to 50,000 to 100,000 people on the other. That's, a, that's an incredibly broad range. And the policies you do to avoid two to four million deaths are very, very different than the policies you do to avoid you know, 50,000 to 100,000 deaths. All right, so let's clear up. Let's, let's clear up. A, actually, I, thought, I, think I, know you'll, I think I know how you'll answer this, but come, maybe I'm not sure. What's... Dr. Fauci up to when he says this is 10 times more lethal 
than the flu. He cannot know that. He should not be saying that. He cannot know, can he? Uh, he doesn't but know. He doesn't know. Yeah, and All he right. can't know because nobody has done the, the serologic, it's the, sorry, sorry to use check that, but like the serologic test means how many people in the population have antibodies to the virus. So that's what you need to know. Okay. No test so, has been done like that. So we, he can't know that. Nobody knows that. So he's reflecting is his guess on what that is. And uh, I'm reflecting my guess on what it is. The fact is neither of us know it. Neither right. of us know that number because there's no scientific test yet done on, or no scientific study done to establish that number in any broad population. So what do we need to know? I mean, this, is, this just strikes me. I, this is a little on the mind boggling side. You're saying, and it, it seems to me just irrefutable. Nobody can know the ratio unless they have a true measure of the denominator in the ratio. You just can't, it's mathematically meaningless. Or if it's not meaningless, if the denominator is people who've been tested, you know are sick, then maybe you could say at least it's, that's an upper bound on the lethality, but it's not, it's not an accurate measure of how lethal this coronavirus is at all. All right, so I'm a little bit astounded, maybe, unless you tell me I shouldn't be, that they've shut down the economy without knowing quite what they're doing. I mean, I, I think, um, am I, am I? No, I, I'm astounded as well. Uh, you are. Because I, here's the thing. I think that uh, there is a lot of disagreement within the scientific community about what exactly what that number is. People of goodwill. Yes. Intelligent um, people. So there, there's part. very bright people, friends of mine, who I, I respect very highly, that disagree very strongly with me about what, what that number is. They don't know it, and I don't know it. We should be honest about that. Uh, and we should be honest with, about that with people who who make these policy decisions when we're making them. Uh, in a sense, like people plug the, the worst case into, those, into their models. They project forward and say two to four million deaths. Newspapers pick up the two to four million deaths. Politicians have to respond. Um, and the scientific basis for that projection is, is completely, there's, there isn't, there, there's no study underlying that scientific projection in the sense of that number, that denominator of that number doesn't exist. We don't know. All right. So we know, we know why the press does what it does because it is in their interest to attract ratings, sell newspapers, magazines, and so forth. So the press from the beginning of the press 150 years ago, the modern press has tended toward the sensational. We get that. We understand that once you get the public very concerned, politicians must respond. We get that. But right back at the beginning, is a gap. We don't know how lethal it is. What do we need to do to find out? Yeah, so we have to run studies. And that's, that's why I've been working on the last, uh, last couple of weeks, um, basically full time, actually three weeks full time. Uh, it's, so uh, what you need is a sample of people in the population who are, I mean, essentially representative of the population some population, you need uh, a test that can measure antibodies in the blood. And those actually only have been approved in the last week or, and so in the US. So tell me right there, stop there for a moment if you would, distinguish between the kind of test you're talking about now and the kind of tests that the president has been talking about in his press conferences for 10 days or two weeks now saying we're shipping more and more tests, we're going to get more tests out to the public. These are two different kinds of tests, yeah, is that so correct? The, the tests, so there's two, like the one kind of test is called a PCR test a polymerase chain reaction test. The PCR test measures DNA. It's an RNA virus, but you have to, there's one step, but it, it, that's a technical point. The key thing is it measures whether the virus is in you. And it's, it's useful potentially for clinical, you know, like if I want to distinguish between COVID-19 and a flu, I can do a PCR test and I can know, okay, you, you, you don't have COVID-19. You, you likely right. have the flu. I'm going to treat you differently. Uh, so if you're, you're in an urgent care clinic or in an emergency room, this test is very valuable. Yeah, it's useful. It means useful okay. information if you're caring for a patient. If you want to know in the population how many people have had it and recovered from it, you want to know the denominator, you have to have the antibody test, the test that measures how you've reacted to the virus being in you by producing antibodies, how many people have had the evidence that they've had the virus in them already and recovered from it or, or, or not. Um, you need both in the denominator. And so with the, with, that, with, the, with the antibody test, you can get the denominator for the population fatality rate, for the, anything of the population. Um, 
Um, it's only in the last week and some that that's, they become available. Uh, the FDA, I think, approved the first ones only only a little while ago. Uh, and, all right, and then so if when you say testing populations, well, well, it's like a survey, right? You, the president. That's what I was about to say. The president keeps talking about we're at war. This is a campaign. Well, we know how we handle surveys and political campaigns. There's polling going on all the time. You poll in a state, you poll in a city, you put together a representative sample for the entire nation, and you do it two or three times a day between start date and whatever election day is. And is that the kind of testing that you would like to see taking yeah, place? I, I mean, it's, it's a little, hopefully a little more, I mean, a lot of polls are, are let's just, let's, let's, and, uh, uh, Peter, I owe this to you, I, I, in all honesty, so I'm just gonna say up front, so I'm gonna steal it from you directly uh, from our earlier conversation. If you just polled, Democrats, the president looks absolutely terrible. Right. If you just polled Republicans, the president looks pretty good. Um, neither test tells you, I mean, this tells you about the population you're polling. All, all samples that you draw tell you about the, the population that they're, they're, they're drawn from. What we want for this is we want a representative population of, of, of Americans. And actually more than that, because the, 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 dead, the virus is deadly when the healthcare resources in an area are overwhelmed to care for the people who really get sick with it. And there are a lot, and this is a deadly virus. There's no, make no mistake. And I hope I, I never, I, I have no, no one gets confused by that. The absolutely deadly virus. So what you want is the healthcare resources, the, 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 the ICU doctors, the ICU beds, the ventilators, all that should be available for, for the people who really, really, really get sick. Um, so what you uh, so what you want is not just population representative of the nation as a whole, but like local areas, so you can see where the places are most likely, where the demand for the ICU beds is going to be highest. Move resources to into there, try to try to relieve some of the pressure, because that's what really kills with this virus. All right. So I have here's Holman Jenkins in the Wall Street Journal. I think he published this a day or two before your own piece appeared. I found it very striking. Layman that I am, and as you know, that means I'm carrying all kinds of confused thoughts around in between my ears, but layman that I am, I thought the whole reason for this shutdown, the shelter at home, shelter in place approach, was that somehow or other the virus would die out, and then we could all open the doors and go out into the sun-filled air again. Holman Jenkins write this, we are crushing our economy, meaning telling everybody to leave work and stay at home, we're crushing our economy simply to meter out how quickly the consequences fall on our exhausted healthcare workers. I repeat, we are slowing the economy to a crawl to slow the rate of a thing happening that will have to happen anyway, close quote. Is that correct? It's partly correct and partially incorrect. So part, the part that's incorrect is it doesn't have to be the case that our healthcare workers are overwhelmed. Right, they, they could just be worked to the. They could just be whelmed, if you will. They just just uh, <laughs> push to the All point right. where they can deal with it, and that's it. Uh, if you have, like, I think Italy is a case study of what happens when a healthcare system is overwhelmed with this virus. And Why by overwhelmed, that that too could be put almost in mathematical terms, in the sense that you simply have more patients, more patients who are in serious trouble, and apparently most of the trouble is respiratory. They're having trouble breathing more patients than you have re ventilators to keep them alive. Is that uh, correct? Instance, right, so, and I don't think that's where we are. I mean, New York has enough ventilators, I think. It may not have enough ICU doctors. I don't think Italy's gonna recur in the US, but I don't, I don't know, because I don't know that denominator in order to do the right projections. Um, so I think, uh, so it's not that it's, it's so you want, a, you want an o o a sample of the population at large so you know how the disease is going, but you also want local representative samples from all over the place. Just like in a presidential election, you want polls in every state because it's not just a nationwide uh, referendum. And Jay, what's the timeline on that? How, as the public health professional, that's you, how soon do you believe you'll have the information you need to decide which kind of, whether you're correct that the mortality rate is very low or whether those colleagues of yours with whom you're disputing this are correct and the mortality rate is actually quite high? How soon? I'm, I'm hoping to, so we've been working very, very hard. Uh, things have happened uh, as far as moving studies along uh, in the last two or three weeks that normally would have taken years. Uh, you know, people, pe uh, like, there's a lot of, as you probably understood, a lot of concern about this and people are uh, mobilizing in, in, in incredible ways to do this. I, I'm hoping 
that if we can get, uh, we've got volunteers who who offered up 15,000 tests. We, we will have a, a live survey in Santa Clara County and in LA County, I hope next week, if the tests arrive as we plan. There, there, uh, there's groups that have offered up 4 million tests. We might be able to take this nationwide. Uh, and these are the new serological, if I'm using the correct term. Serological tests, the antibody right. tests, yeah. The antibody tests, that's the term for yeah, it. Those right. are, those are those, so these are the new, new tests. There's still a lot that can go wrong in I mean, the, the, the test might not arrive. They might have bad test characteristics. There's a lot we have to check to make sure that we're not producing junk numbers. But that's that's. Uh, but if things go right, I'm hoping in two weeks we'll know in LA and Santa Clara the population prevalence, and in uh, within a month, by the end of by the end of April, we'll know for the country at large. All right. And a lot of things have to happen right, including finding funding for these uh, people are volunteering their time and their effort, but it's still. You know, it's still a very, very challenging thing to do a nationwide sample. Uh, well, wait a minute. When you say finding the funding, Congress just passed a $2.2 trillion bill without funding for this kind of necessary research? I mean, I think the, I don't know, I haven't looked carefully at the bill. I really haven't had time to look at it. I don't know that they haven't. Um, I I'm think hoping that on page 887, <laughs> section three, subsection Z, it says give Bhattacharya whatever he needs. I don't think, I don't know. I'm pretty sure it doesn't say that, but I think, I do think, uh, it, I don't care if I do the study. I, I want, I just want the study done. We need this number. All right. But it could be, we could begin to get results you would consider meaningful in a matter of a couple of weeks. Two weeks to a month, I think we'll know much, we'll, we'll have some, some results starting to roll in from this, All right. hopefully from my work. And if your suspicion that the mortality, I, I'm sure I'm using the wrong term, but the, the death rate, the fatality, if, if your suspicion that it's not more lethal than the flu, but substantially less lethal than the flu, if that suspicion is confirmed, what should we begin to do differently? Well, I think the universal quarantine, or essentially that's what we have, uh, is incredibly costly. It costly to, and uh, people have characterized it as costly to the economy, and so, and so and you get accused of being crass because you're you know, comparing dollars with people's lives, right? That's, yes, yes. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm actually kind of sympathetic to that, but actually it's not just dollars to lives, it's, do, it's, 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 it's lives to lives, right? A global economic collapse will cost lives of, of, I believe, millions of people. And not just in the United States, I mean worldwide, right? Uh, uh, how do people die? I've, if I get sick and I stop breathing, I understand why I die. If, if, if suddenly we're all poorer, I mean, what is it in my lifetime? The GDP has quadrupled. Well, you know, people, yeah, we, I, give I, we go back to 1950s levels of standards of living. What's wrong with that? What's the mechanism that kills people? Yeah, I mean, even even in the last reset, the Great Recession of 10 years ago, which I think the, the one that's coming might be might might like, we'll stop calling it great. Um, the the uh, there were uh, huge numbers of people who died from uh, from the, uh, depression. Uh, opioid overdose, you know, these deaths of despair. Right. Uh, that's a mechanism that's, I don't know how unique it is to the U.S., but it's certainly in a lot of developed countries that you have things like that where you don't have any purpose in life and you, you spiral downward. I think there's that. Uh, in, in other poorer countries, you, some of the diseases that are, the, the, and, uh, the, and conditions that, that used to, you know, are, are, are slowly going away as life expectancy goes up, could come back. I mean, there's no, there's no iron law that says that, uh, that if, I mean, that, that income is going to continue going up for GDP is going to go up forever, right? It's if, and if there's a global depression, there are country and uh, that, that, if, that will face enormous difficulties caring for the health of its popul their populations. You still have family back in India. What happens in India? I'm, if, I'm scared to death of it. I got cousins. I mean, I don't know. Oh. I, mean, I think a global it's a, so the, the the rise in GDP worldwide has pulled billions of people I think out of poverty and raised life expectancy everywhere. If that gets reversed, the flip side is that means lots and lots of lives shortened unnecessarily. Um, I think that's the flip side to, re to remember is it's not just dollars versus lives, it's lives versus lives. All right. So in, in practical terms, if we stop quarantining, what would you do differently if you discovered that the lethality rate is 0.01 instead of 0.1? You'd say, Robinson, get back to work? Or you'd say, no, 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 you're still high risk, but send your kids to work. What, what, what are the kinds yeah, of decisions you make that reopen the economy? 
targeted quarantine could make some sense. And actually, once you have a test, an antibody test, you're positive, Peter, you can go to work. Even though, even though we, we, we both have gray hair, we could go back to work. <laughs> it, meaning that if you, once you have this and clear it, you're immune at that point? Uh, that seems like what the evidence is suggesting. Now, there's still uh, some work left to be done to, even to verify that. But uh, j just the other day, a couple of days ago, there was a report in JAMA uh, that the, 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 the primary, the, the main, uh, you know, top journal in, of the American Medical Association, uh, one of the top journals in the U.S. in medicine, that reported that people who had the disease recover from it. You take their serum out, yes, spin it down, isolate the antibodies to the virus, then inject it in people who are really, really sick with the virus. It helps cure them. Okay. So, pro all right. Two weeks to a month, I'm coming back to the practical timeline. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, if, if Jay's right, what am I going to be reading in the newspaper and when am I going to be reading it? We'll begin to get the good, good that is to say, important data in two weeks to a month, if yeah. all goes well. If I'm right, it'll be, I, I'll think it's good news. If I'm wrong, which, which, I mean, I just want to make clear, I could very well be. It's, this is a scientific dispute over, right. over, a test, over a study that's still not to be done, right? I don't right, know what that right. going to be. If I'm wrong... And you let's say it's only one percent of the population. Then we'll have to make some very very tough choices, right? Because uh, you can't eradicate it if it's let's say it's one or two percent of the population. You can't eradicate the whole thing. You can't just isolate and it'll stop spreading altogether. It's not zero spread when you have a, a quarantine in place order. It's slow spread. I, I think then we have to decide. Uh, some places we let off, let off the gas and let people start going back to work where the healthcare system can manage the, the, play, the thing. We have, to, we have to work really hard on, a, on a, getting a vaccine going. I mean, it's, it'll be some very difficult choices if that, if I'm mm. on that number. But and we need to know that number. So you just mentioned, what about treatments? Again, just a general for the layman, rough feeling timeline for treatments. Um, the president has mentioned this combination of hydrochloride, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and azithromycin seems to, there's, and then Dr. Fauci called that anecdotal evidence. Is there evidence of treatments that at least control symptoms and how quickly can that stuff be tested and rolled out for use? I mean, people are working on, I, actually I have a little study, we'll see if it gets done, but because uh, I don't have a ton, ton of time to look at it, but uh, on, on, um, on, on checking whether that actually does work or not. That, I think that's still the, 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 we still have to wait for the results on that. All right. Um, and this serum therapy where we identify people who've recovered and draw blood from them and then administer their plasma to ill people, how, how far off is that? Can we do that? So there, there was a, that study I just told, told you about was five yes. people published in JAMA two days ago. Uh, I mean, you know, I have to say, I've been very impressed with the ingenuity and cleverness of, of my colleagues in trying to find new ways to treat this and find risk factors. I mean, we've learned a ton about this in a very short time. Actually, that's, that, let me ask you a little bit about that, because so many of us are just sitting at home. I'm trying to remain useful, typing away on my computer, but you look out the window, it just feels as though the country is at a halt but you're in your office, you're in touch with the profession, there's activity of all kinds taking place within the medical profession, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, people are hard, very hard at work. It's like, it's war. I mean, what, what the president said is right in that sense. I mean, I, it's my, I haven't, uh, I've, I've, been, I've been taking a weekend day off. I mean, I've been, I've been coming in, I just, I think, I, I feel like I'm at war. I wanna, I want, the, and the war, is, and the enemy is the virus. Right. So. Jay, what about a vaccine? What about the ultimate? Treatment. That what about something that just ends this? Is that months, years? I mean, it's a technically very challenging thing. And, and once you have something you think is a vaccine, then demonstrating that it actually works is also a challenging thing. I mean, I, who knows? I, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I would guess years. Years. All yeah. right. Jay, a few last questions. Your piece in the Wall Street Journal appeared as we speak today. It appeared four days ago, right? Tuesday. Yes, it appeared four days ago. What's the response to that, Ben? Uh, it's been overwhelming. I have to say, I don't know. I don't normally do shows like this, Peter, as you know. Um, uh, and so I'm not used to being um, sort of in front of the camera, if you will. Uh, but but I think uh, it's been overwhelming. And, and a, a lot of my colleagues have written in support. I get the sense there were a lot of people that were thinking this way already and were uncomfortable with the definitive proclamations of the modeling modeling that we'd seen. 
I think there's a lot of people. There's also a lot of people that, for whatever reason, don't like the fact that I said what I said. So oh, really? Yeah. May I ask what, what is the kind that people think you're saying things that are dangerous, that will yeah, raise false I mean, I hopes? There's, or? there's some of this like, uh, Jay, get with the program. I, mean, I, can, I think literally I can find an email that says that. Uh, you know, you know, you're being irresponsible by, by, by putting up information like this at a time where we're in crisis, that kind, that kind of thing. Uh, I don't know. My reaction to this is we have a obligation as, so, I mean, you know, there's a cloak of authority that, that happens when you're, you, you, you know, the litany of, of those horrible. You are a professor of medicine. Yeah, that's at awful, right? So like, you, therefore you should believe me. I mean, I think we have a very, very strong responsibility to be utterly honest as we can be about what we know and we don't know, especially if we have that cloak of authority. And I think, uh, I think that, um, I think to some extent we haven't been, we, the, the, the profession hasn't been as honest as it could have been up front about where that uncertainty was. Now, I don't, and I don't, this is a little bit, maybe I've gone too far because it may be that people on, just honestly believe there wasn't uncertainty about this. I, I don't know. It's hard for me to distinguish. All right. We have a new, we have a, the outbreak of a pandemic. It's taken everybody by surprise. There are all kinds of political recriminations. Trump should have done this. The whole country should have known that. We should have stockpiled this, that, and the, fine. The fact is it took everybody by surprise. Is this the new normal? Or is this like the 1918 influenza, a once a century event? Or now that we have constant airline travel, a networked world, yeah. should we expect this every year, every decade, every quarter century? Yeah, I think it's, we've had already in the last 20 years, we had H1N1, we had SARS, we had uh, avian flu, we had, uh, no, maybe that was, no, I'm sorry, uh, that we had, uh, we had uh, 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 Ebola, I think this is the new normal. Um, I think this is a this is the part of the cost of globalization. I see. Um, and I think um, what we need is a 21st century approach to it. I don't think ending globalization is the answer. I think that will kill more people than than uh, the viruses will ever will. Uh, but a, a 21st century approach would involve systematically putting in place uh, a, pop, a, a a surveillance infrastructure that looks at populations that, that can draw very, very, like these studies that I'm doing right now should just be a routine part of surveillance instead of, instead of like um, the surveillance uh, infrastructure. Jay, Jay, can I just, when you, when you use the term surveillance for an old cold warrior like me, <laughs> that means Tom Clancy novels. It means listening to people's phone conversations. You're using it in a technical sense. You use it differently from the common understanding of the term, I believe. So explain, you'd better explain what you mean by surveillance. Sure. Uh, it's not so, big brothery stuff, is it? No, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's like running surveys, except the surveys would involve taking people's blood after they agree to let you have the blood. Oh, after they agree, all right, yes, thank yeah. you very much. And not a lot of it either, right? So yeah, um, right. Uh, systematically looking for these diseases, having, having like these population level samples just sitting there routinely, uh, in labs so they can be analyzed uh, rather than waiting to see if the things comes. And then, um, and then, and then, I mean, I'll just give you a sense with the flu, flu vac flu tracking involves uh, someone sending a test into the CDC lab. The CDC then is tested and says, okay, yeah, it's positive. They, ha they make an assumption for everyone that's, uh, that's positive in the CDC lab. There are 79 or 80 others that weren't tested, that, 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 that are positive out, out there in the population that didn't show up in the lab. That number, that 80 to one number is based on guesswork right. to some extent. Um, instead, we could have a, a, a population surveillance of all the time, right? We just, we do this with, uh, we do this obviously with political polls, but also with social science polls, right? We have a, we have a this decennial census, that's an, ex, that's an example of the entire population. You wouldn't want to do that. But we have the American Community Survey done every year, which surveys a very large part of the population. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the current population study, which that's how we get our unemployment rate number every year. It's, a big, it's just a big survey where people call up 100,000 people and get, uh, ask, you, or ask, ask them, are you working or not working today? Right. Kind of thing. So Jay, it, it, are you, does all this imply a larger role for the federal government? Are we going to come out of this with some permanent diminishment of our role. freedoms? The CDC already plays a big role. Yep. They just should be doing what they're doing differently. I mean, bigger is not the right word for this. 
Okay, so this is we need. It's not necessarily this is a legitimate function of government, Peter. Right? I mean, I think you. Yes, no, that. no. That's what I'm trying to distinguish yeah. because th th there will be political repercussions from all of this. Um, you know, in my judgment, there are some politicians who are enjoying the limelight much too much as it is. Uh, all right, last last question here. China, South Korea, Italy, the United Kingdom, your own family's country of India, the United States. If from the point of view, two questions, from the point of view, simply from the point of view of physical safety and well-being, of all the countries on earth, where would you choose to place yourself and your family right now? Right here. I mean, okay. I, I, I think the United States um, is well positioned to, I mean, if, as long as our healthcare systems don't get overwhelmed, we're gonna be okay. All right. Second and final question, from the point of view of, you've used the war metaphor yourself, from the point of view of fighting back, the technical and the technical apparatus, the, not, the human capital, the infrastructure of medical research institutions, from the point of view of addressing this illness and containing it and ameliorating it and ultimately curing it, which country would you rather be working in? The, the U.S. is is a uh, the, is the number one country for this kind of innovation. Uh, China actually has a lot of great scientists too. Um, so I think uh, this this kind the scientific effort to beat this will be a worldwide thing. Oh, it will. Yeah, I don't think it's going to be just an American thing. I think America will play a very very important role, but the but the good ideas are going to come from everywhere, and that's that's actually very encouraging. Jay. This is a non-technical question. How long until your own life feels normal again? <laughs> I hope soon. I mean, I, I, I've, uh, you, you've known me for a long time, Peter. You normally don't see me on a bike around campus. I've been biking to campus every day <laughs> for fear of, of someone stopping me and asking for my papers. Uh, <laughs> but you, you do have papers now. Have, have you've paper. been officially declared an essential worker. It says I'm essential. Right. Excellent. There. Excellent. You, that's you not signed by your wife. All right. That's good. All right. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. Jay, Dr. Ba Dr. Jay Bhattacharya, professor of medicine at Stanford University. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's a real pleasure.